Thank you, Oren. We have Oren Kloff in studio today. He's the author of Pitch Anything, which Johnny and I had the joy to read. Absolutely, And yes. uh, a lot of parallels between what we teach from a social skill standpoint to what's going on in the boardroom, which is pretty exciting because I know yeah. for a lot of our listeners and also our clients who come through the program, they think it's really two different playing fields. You got to be a certain way in the boardroom and a certain way socially. And you kind of break through that in understanding some of these frames that work in both settings. So we're going to delve even deeper into that. You have a new book coming out, The User's Guide to Power. You're an investor, a venture capitalist who's raised more than $2 billion with your novel approach to understanding the prehistoric part of our brain, the croc brain, as you call it. We'll delve into that a little bit as well. And we're going to talk about how it applies to your sales pitch, raising money over $2 million a week, getting a raise, and your ability to crack the code as a deal closer. You are a power frame guy. We're going to define what we mean by that. And we had an episode, I think it was about uh, almost three months now, about mental models and frameworks and how frame comes into play with our understanding of the world and also how we present ourselves to others. So we're going to break down frames for those of you who are listening who maybe are unfamiliar with that concept entirely. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what's changed since Pitch Anything came out. We had a, a great little back and forth here about some trends you're noticing in terms of pitches. You're really tapped into the VC world. So everyone who has great ideas, you're pitching, you're going to want to tune into this episode. So thank you for joining us. We have a few well, questions you, you, here. You be careful thanking it because I got 50 minutes here. You might be, uh, <laughs> uh, the, you might not be so appreciative by the time I leave. Well, we uh, heard we have three hours, right? There's no hours. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to keep going. But let's delve first into this understanding of the brain, because I think for a lot of us, especially when we're thinking about having to impress other people, win a deal, we go right into analysis, right? We got to come up with all the facts, all the data, all the figures, the PowerPoint slides to, to make that deal work. And you have a totally different approach to it. I do, I do. And it's funny, other people are starting to think this way as well. So I read this book, Sapiens, right? Yeah, really yeah. good. You guys uh, read that. And uh, he makes the point, uh, in, which I ran into quite a few years ago, of how do you access the mind of a human, right? And, and how do you touch someone's soul? Well, when they cut people over, open, there's no mind. They can't find a mind. Like you dig in there, there's a brain, there's blood vessels. Uh, and, and there's all these systems, and when they cut people over the open, there's no soul, they can't find it no matter where they look. So I met a cognitive psychologist, I hired him, and, I, and he said, look, you don't understand how the brain works. And I go, ah, I've studied psychology, my mom's a clinical psychologist, my right. dad's a sociologist, I've read every book, I've you know, got $100 million of sales uh, in my past. He goes, you don't understand how the mind works, how the brain works. I go, well, I understand it. You know, you, you have psychology and people want what they can't have and there's time constraints and there are all these uh, things that persuade people. He goes, you don't understand how the brain works. So then I stopped talking. I started listening, which is hard to do, as you all know. He said, look, I'm a cognitive psychologist. I only care about how information, I don't care about emotions and feelings and whether you love somebody or hate somebody. Like cognitive psychologists just care about how information moves through the brain yes. and what it does when it's in there and how pieces of information are broken up, reassembled, come out, the confusion that that creates and the opportunities that creates for, for clarity and persuasion. But how does information move through the brain? So information moves through the brain um, through a couple large pieces that exist. So so uh, as human beings develop, the brain didn't you know grow like a strawberry, right? Like a small strawberry or like a squirrel. <laughs> small squirrel, then a medium-sized squirrel, and then a large squirrel. That's not how the brain developed. It developed as a very primitive uh, tool to keep a organism alive, right? And so as we became... Uh, Homo erectus, and we fell out of the trees in in the in Africa and started running through the savanna. And the part of the brain that really kept us alive and was most dominant was the crocodile brain, and that's sort of back behind in the nape of your neck, and that's the brainstem. And it really, to simplify it, the croc brain really only cares about a very limited number of things. It meets you and you start going, oh, the ROI on this project and the IRR is 18% and the downside protection um, is, is uh, you know, there's no way you can lose your money and the upside is a 2X on your money within three years and we're a SaaS application that is a new kind of dating app for grandmothers and squirrels, <laughs> whatever it is. And then, so the, 
the actual physical part of the mind of the other person that's listening to you is thinking, huh, here's something that's moving and making noise, right? Is this something I should eat? Is this something I should fuck? Is this something I should kill? Right? I got to answer with those three questions. Right. Right? And that's the first part of the brain that processes anything you're saying. So it, it only, the, you got to get past that part of the mind, right? And so you get information and your attention past that part of the brain. There's thinking very simple things. Is, should I eat this? Should I mate with it? Or should I kill it? Uh, and, and so you got to move your information past that very aggressive part of the brain in, up into the midbrain is the next place where this information physically gets to. And in the midbrain, it only cares really about social status. Are you somebody that can uh, uh, help me move up in society to where things are easier to get? Can, or can you sanction me like a police officer? Or do you have to do what I say and can I sanction you? And unless that other person believes you're a peer to them or you're more or you're higher up the social hierarchy, the dominant hierarchy than them, they won't pay attention to you. And they feel like they have power over you. So it's very interesting. When somebody thinks they have power over you or they're better than you or they're higher in the dominance hierarchy than you, a few things happen. Their, their ability to focus narrows, right? So they don't see things broadly. Their appreciation of you is literally skin deep. They can only see you at a very surface level. And more importantly, they, they take risky behaviors around you and with you because they feel like they're in a powerful position. They see you narrowly, they only see you at a surface level, and they behave and they load up on risk around you. So maybe that means they're looking at their phone or taking phone calls or not paying attention at all. So until they believe you're a peer or you're superior to them in the social hierarchy, they can't pay any attention to you. So you got to get past the midbrain, and only then you get to the neocortex. And the neocortex is the part of the brain that really can appreciate the things that you're saying about your idea, your project, yourself. Uh, you know, whatever it is. And so that's how information moves to the brain. Until you understand that, you, um, you can't organize your persuasion, your ideas, the things you want to say correctly because you're trying to get right into the neocortex and the neocortex does not want to hear about the things that you've got to say immediately. You have to earn your way up to that part of the brain. You know, it was interesting upon reading that in your book, the first thing I was was thinking about was some studies that I saw that if you put a mouse in a new environment, before that mouse eats, drinks, sleeps, does anything else, it has to go around the whole room and investigate it until it feels safe to do those other things. So until that brain feels safe in that, in that environment where you're pitching and, and throwing all these ideas out, it has to know... Uh, it has to feel good of who you are, what's going on, and and quell that that part of its the, all those questions that it's dealing with. Yeah, so you're that mouse in a way because you go into a meeting and what mm -hmm. do you do? You talk about fucking skiing, fishing in Florida, vacation. Mm -hmm. Did you see uh, the the Super Bowl? Uh, did you watch the playoff game? Right? Uh, oh, it sure is hot. It sure it's cold. Can you believe these politicians? Well, you know, so so the reason you're seeking rapport in this way, of course, is to find a safe space mm -hmm. to then for that social acceptance to where you can start to give your pitch, your presentation, sell your ideas. So that you'll see that in other people looking for safety before they start to um, um, even feel like they can sell or pitch, mm -hmm. whatever it is. We we crave that feeling of safety, and that is this uh, crock brain looking to be calm before information can move past it absolutely and one of the things johnny and i were talking about is you know how did you get to this point you, you talked about hiring a cognitive psychologist so how do you determine that you know what i need some help speaking to these people on that primitive level or was that totally outside of your reality until he started breaking this down for you yeah i, I think it's really in interesting because i work in a universe of deals mm -hmm. and not although we do help startups you know, largely, uh, you ever think about it, you see like such and such office buildings sold for $200 million in downtown Los Angeles or in midtown Manhattan, such building is worth $600 million. $600 million, how is it worth exactly $600 million, right? It's such a like round number. Right. Because when you start dealing with round numbers, it's like, okay, you know, the number is 592 million, just six, we'll offer you 600 million. It doesn't really matter. So in the deals that I work in, like there is money to throw at things. And all the guys I work with, they just, if they have a problem, they just throw money at it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, they don't go to life hacker, deal hacker, <laughs> hacker net, hacker dot net, you know, how to uh, get a phone bill, AT&T cheaper. There's no coupons. You know, it's like, oh, we need to be in Sacramento at three o'clock, right? There's no Southwest flight. Okay, charter a plane. Oh, it's $24,000. Okay, but we need to be there. Like, it's no fun spending $24,000, but we also need to be there. And so when you're in the deal business, you're constantly just throwing money at problems. I mean, I just if you just come to our office and look around, like, you know, I'll order, when I get an iPhone, I'll order like five iPhone Xs, right? At the same time, I lose a phone, I can't go to the AT&T store. I just got to go in a drawer and grab out another phone, fire it up and keep moving. Like, you sure. know, so, so we just, you know, at that level or, you know, those little phone chargers that are $122 sure. each, the battery charger, I just order like 50 at a time and leave them everywhere, right? Because you can never <laughs> find, you just throw money at problems. So uh, um, we were working on a big deal that was a couple hundred million dollars. And, you know, success in that deal for us would have been five, six million dollars in in RIP or, or SPIF or whatever you want to call it. And we didn't feel confident that we knew the motivation of the, uh, the buyers, you know, the guys we were pitching to. And that's, you know, always want to know what motivates them. And so I was like, okay, you know, we did, we hired um, some research on them and we, you know, spent some, time and calling around and we just couldn't really figure them out. I'm like, okay, I'll hire a cognitive psychologist and show him the scenario and maybe he can teach us, you know? And so I called up, it was a uh, university of San Diego and I go, hey, I need to hire a cognitive <laughs> a psychologist. I didn't say cognitive, just a psychologist. And they're like, um, we're not rent a psychologist. Here. <laughs> I'm like, I really, <laughs> like, it's business and academic. Like, <laughs> like everyone we, has we don't a price. Rent. This is whatever. not like uh, Airbnb for psychologists where this is the university of California system. I need to talk to a psychologist, and they're like, this, we're, uh, "So, so I explained, and they go, look, you can't really hire a session, but you can sponsor a lab.' I'm like, okay, how much is that?' They're like, "It's ten thousand dollars." I'm like, oh, "Okay, fine." <laughs> so we write a check, sponsor a lab, and it was like an eye movement lab, nothing that we needed, but at least you know I got in a room, you know, the next couple of days with a guy that I wanted to talk to, and I explained all the problem, and he goes, "Look, I, you need a therapist, right? Not a cognitive psychologist." And that's how we got into all this. Uh, he goes, you know, at least for the time that we're together, let me explain to you how the brain works. And that's how we fell into this whole situation. And you talk about this phrase neurofinance. I've never come across it previously. Sure. It's novel to my mind. Can you break it down for our listeners so that they understand what it is that you're talking about? Yeah. So I think, uh, I can break it down quite simply. When people pitch finance deals, right, you've got a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet has some assumptions. And those assumptions, you know, you apply math in base 10 uh, uh, in an Excel spreadsheet and you come up with some kind of projection. And that projection is typically how we're going to make money in the future. And this is a very, you fall into the analyst frame. And the analyst frame triggers all kinds of neurology and things in the brain when you talk about facts, details, information, and uncertainty. And generally that creates fear. Our brains were never designed to do complex math. And so when, when I think about the, neuro, the neurology of finance, it boils down to uh, uh, people want what they can't have, people chase that which moves away from them, and people only value that which they pay for. And you can read Kahneman and all this Nobel Prize, you know, finance stuff, but it just boils down to that. So yes, you have to communicate numbers, you have to communicate pro forma and assumptions and IRR and what's likely to happen in the future and exit strategies and all that. But it ha- for me, it has to be in context of people want what they can't have, people chase that which moves away from them, and they only value that which they pay for. And that's the neurology of finance if you want people to buy what you have. And then after they're buying you, then the pro formas, the spreadsheets come out, they're doing their diligence. But as you say in the book, during the pitch, that is going to bog you down and that's not going to get you the deal. So, yeah, I I think ultimately what people miss is they, um, you first have to create wanting and then you can provide the details that make that desire feel more certain. Right. So 
we call it confirmatory diligence. If, if, so for, for most people come in, they have a spreadsheet, they have a PDF, they have uh, press clippings, they have a PowerPoint, they have a demo, uh, and they have uh, user experiences, and they have rankings, you know, by some, and, and all that stuff, I said, that's fine, but to me, that is confirmatory diligence. That is not compelling. It is, um, it provides certainty, but it's not compelling. So, so that's the first thing I do in a deal is basically throw out everything that they have because it doesn't create wanting and it's not compelling. So we say, what is compelling in a pitch? And then once people say I'm compelled or I want it, then you layer in the stuff that provides certainty that tips them over the edge. And outside of the cognitive psychologist that you hired, it seems like hiring outside experts, mentorship played a big role in you getting to this king deal maker. You know, where did this all start? Were yeah, you so doing deals as a kid, running a lemonade stand. What was going on? No, no. I mean, I was like this, you know, like a lot of the guys you deal with in yourselves, although AJ, I don't want to uh, put words in your mouth. I mean, I was a computer geek. This is not where it all started. My dad was a college professor. We had computers growing up. Uh, you know, the, the, I played some sports, but mainly I was in the computer lab. I, the girls were not like, hey, what's Orrin doing this weekend? Do you have Orrin's <laughs> number? <laughs> like, that was not the problem. <laughs> uh, and, and so I really viewed these social environments, both business, although when you're young, you, know, you don't have much business, but um, the social environments is confusing as like a black box. Right, like you shoot in one red marble and two blue marbles would shoot out. Right, another time you shoot a red marble and three yellow marbles would come out, and then you 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 know press this button and nothing would happen. It's like a black couldn't understand how the black box of social interaction works, so I started looking for blueprints. And then years down the road, I met my partner uh, that I worked with with for quite a few years, and he was a natural. He had no interest in teaching. Hey, you know, I go, hey Russ, why did you do that? You know, drove around Bentley, lived in a mansion, uh, you know, came out every once in a while for meetings. We, we spoke once a day by phone, but he would do these amazing things. I'm like, why did we do that? I'll never forget. We went to a meeting with uh, Virgin um, at, to meet uh, Branson at uh, his Virgin headquarters here in Santa Monica. And I got in there and some assistant came out and I gave the assistant my card, right? And Russ literally took the card out of the assistant's hand and threw it in my face and goes, never do that. <laughs> Amazing. Right? Never do that again. You know, I was obviously supplicating in some way sure. that he didn't approve of or wasn't in his system. But he didn't explain to me why I just got <laughs> card, my own card thrown in my face like, a, you know, a poker card style. And, and so... He had, uh, I mean, the lessons I learned with him were brutal. We had a $30 million airplane parked at Palomar Airport, and I would drive down from L.A., and, you know, I'd leave three hours early, but you know how traffic is. So so one day, I'm, I'm six minutes away. I call him. I'm like, Russ, I'm six minutes away. He's like, wheels up at 8 o'clock. I mean, it's our <laughs> plane, right? There's nobody else on it but you and I. We're flying to San Francisco, right? It's, it's, you know, it's an airplane has got 18 seats on it. Uh and and so I'm like I'll be there uh, as I'm pulling up at 8:01. The plane is taking off. I have to drive to the airport and find a Southwest flight to San Francisco. I get there, miss the meeting. But just a million of these these stories. Um, you know, we we drove his Bentley to a meeting. Um, we got just two minutes before the meeting. Uh, we were at the Mondrian. He pulls around at sunset. He goes, oh, "Switch with me, right? Because um, I don't just want to jump out and go to the meeting, and you can valet the <laughs> car, right?" Uh, so we pull up the meeting and the, the, uh, gas thing goes ding, right? As we pull up, he goes, go fill it up with gas and then valet it. So, you know, Sunset Boulevard getting yeah, gas, yeah. right? It like, uh, so I feel like, you know, it's a hundred gallon tank or something in the Bentley. <laughs> uh, I did that, valet it, run to the meeting, meeting's over, like 25 minutes long. He's like, come on. So now we're driving all the way back to San. I mean, a million of these brutal stories, um, but he was genius. And so... To your question, I just sort of had to reverse engineer everything that he was doing, and he took. He was so effective, you know. He, he just created an empire, and I would just take notes after notes, and like, why did Russ do that? And I would try it, and it wouldn't. So, so something that was interesting that happened, you know, that I learned through him. 
uh, man, he, he was such, his humor, uh, he was so good with humor, and he would immediately, when we got on a call, sort of insult the billionaires, or guys managing billions of dollars. Hey, it doesn't seem like you can get to a call on time. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I'll never forget this. Uh, and never forget this. So we were doing a deal, working on a deal with a big group, controlled billions of dollars. Their terms were going back and forth. And Russ replied with the three words, all caps, in the subject line, lose my number. Oh. I was like, I cannot fathom what is happening. Like my brain couldn't process it. You know, they said like uh, when when – Columbus came in the ships. The Indians like couldn't see the ships. You ever heard this myth? Yeah. You know they they, they were just like in, um, it, because they just couldn't understand what was happening. Like my brain couldn't process that in the middle of a deal, like we're a respected finance firm working on a forty million dollar deal, that our leader just in all caps lose my number. But then they came back around and go, oh, we're so sorry, right? Uh, we didn't mean it. We, we capitulate on all the terms. Let's just get the deal done. And so I would see these things. And matter of fact, if I go through his me emails, uh, I don't think he rarely would write an email with more than 15 words in it, right? And most of those were all caps. And half of those were swear words. And yet, yeah, but he did it exactly the right way at the right time. And he would use humor and be very self-deprecating, uh, but at the same time, he would be insulting people exactly the right moment, and I start to see a pattern emerge from him, and I started trying these things, and every once in a while, like, the ball would go through the uprights and go, oh my God, I think I just scored six points. I've had no points in my life ever, <laughs> and I just kicked, you know, a field goal. I just got six points, and, and so slowly, I started seeing this pattern emerge, and now, I still work with him, and I'm better than him in many I mean he just asked funny uh, they were having this conversation he just called me yesterday and said hey can you help me on this deal so student becomes the grasshopper one whatever. of the things I'm hearing that I'm curious about and, and, and we're gonna be speaking about frames in a bit but <clears throat> my curiosity for your your partner Russ and then this rubbing off on you was he a very disciplined man in other areas of his life so that if things didn't go in his way and, and where business like, well, I'm not chasing that because I wouldn't do that in my regular life. I'm certainly not going to do it here. So that's a good question. Uh, his, I mean, that's where I learned from him, eradicate neediness. Never behave like you need it, right? Mm -hmm. And he would kill deals. Ra he would kill deals and say, just that's not acceptable to us. We're not right. going to do that. If those are your terms, we're out. And you know we you know, always have some flexibility. I'm like Russ, that, you know that's a five hundred thousand dollar fee for me. I don't have a lot of <laughs> many five hundred thousand dollars stacked up. Right, yeah. Like I want that fee. Why do you kill that deal? Well, he didn't explain it to me, but in the end, I learned the by by not being needy, you convert so many more mm -hmm. transactions, and you do lose some. Right. So the ones that you lose feel like you could have won. But if you put them in context of all the other ones that went through because you controlled the frame, mm -hmm. you were not acting needy, and you maintained discipline, um, you'll see the ones you lost either were supposed to be lost, weren't right. going to be good partners anyway, or you lost it um, out, of, out of good process. So good process is not being needed. You're going to lose a date. You're going to lose a girlfriend. You're going to lose a deal. You're yeah. lose an investor. You're going to lose a buyer or a customer every once in a while. But the number that you tip in yeah, is far overwhelming. And Stick it's a long game. Yeah. Long game, right? It's yeah. understanding right. that there's more deals and this is a lifetime that I'm going to be and, working towards. Well, there's an integrity to that, too, of what I will and will not do in order to, to get that deal or get the girl or so, whatever that may be. So I like, do, do you guys know Mark from SealFit? Yeah. Yeah. So Mark's actually my neighbor, like literally... Okay. Uh, uh, it's funny, he he moved into the um, office right next to mine in our complex. And uh, actually, I put a, a post out, and uh, all these Navy SEALs sort of ro like ran into our office and started combing through our stuff and everything. And I'm like, what are you guys doing in here? You know, they're Navy SEAL training. Yeah. Uh, they had printed out something confidential to our printer. Oh, no. Because <laughs> they print on the wrong network. And so we weren't supposed to read it, and everybody was scrubbing our office down, uh, commando style. But... There, 
the reason I um, bring up Mark is he runs these workouts and they're brutal. You know, the seal fit workouts or Kokoro. It's in, you know, they're for you, right? And so you have integrity reps. Yeah. They can't watch you the whole time. You know, you're doing push-ups or pull-ups, and of course, they're coming by like, hey, motherfucker, you call that a pull-up, right? But they can't watch you the whole time, and so they have a thing called an integrity rep, and that's where you have to do it for yourself, you know, and they're not supposed to be watching you the whole time, and I think that's the same thing in neediness is you have to have that integrity to yourself of never acting needy because neediness kills deals, and I thought about it, and maybe this is scientific, maybe it's not, but if you think back 150,000, 250,000 years ago during the early formations of societies, so you didn't have anything, right? You had a woman or a man, a dog, a little bit of food, you know, that might last the rest of the day, maybe a little piece of cave, you know, protect you from the weather, and two leaves and a stick. Like, those are the things you own. So when, maybe a tool, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a hatchet or something. But there was no surplus at all of food, of, of women, of meat, of mates. Uh, and the, so when somebody came up to you and they needed something that created fear, because you didn't have anything to give them. So any kind of neediness creates a fear response in sure. somebody. And, and certainly in a deal... I mean, it just goes with it. If you've ever been in a deal, if you've been in the deal business for more than five minutes, if somebody says, hey, we really need this deal or we need this transaction or I need this sale or I need to get this done, uh, there is an immediate surge of power within you. And you go, oh, you need this, huh? <laughs> right. Very interesting. Uh, and, and you start to dig in your heels and slow things down. So neediness slows down deals, kills deals, and you have to eradicate it. And there's a huge discipline around that because when you really want a deal, you want a commission, it really does matter when your manager or your boss or your partner is putting pressure on you to, to close an investment, to close a deal. Um, you're, you're, you know, you're getting pushed and it's emotional and you do need it. So the big question around pitch anything is how do you, when you need something and you want something, and you want to sell what it is you have, uh, do deal making in a way that says, I don't need you, and if you don't behave in the way that's acceptable to me, or you don't do the things that I like, I'll walk away. And those are the, you know, the, those are the twin forces that are fighting in every deal. You can't act needy, you can't seem like you need it, um, you can't sell, you can't be pitchy, but on the same time, you need to close deals and that's what pitch anything really uh is about is how to manage those twin forces that can pull you apart well one of the things you mentioned in the book is that that money is everywhere and it can be found anywhere and what's difficult for somebody who may be starting out is building a frame and in, in which and, and, and cultivating abundance from scarcity yeah which takes time um and 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 even in you were mentioning in one of the later stories of the book where you had left, you were down to about a thousand bucks in your account and which was causing you to project some neediness that you hadn't seen in a while that was coming back because of your situation. And it, it's a, obviously it's important to, to not only cultivate that, but lean into it. Um, what for young guys starting out to be able to, to cultivate that abundance what do you recommend yeah so first of all i like to name things so i think it's a pretty common i didn't invent it but there's the prize frame right Mm -hmm. so that's a name so first of all this this sense of who's the most important person in a relationship creates the prize frame one person is the prize and one person is the supplicant Right. And so it's funny because I laugh at all this win win and these negotiation books. And yeah. I just read a negotiation book. And I mean, they're great for hostage standoffs, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, I need to get these six people back and maybe I'll get four of them. And, you know, we got to pay a quarter million dollars a person or whatever. Yeah. You know, the negotiation is for when there's real, there's something on the table. But when you're, you know, making a deal, um, the other party doesn't have to work. You're not doing a sure exchange, you're not negotiating. Uh, So the prize frame is not about win-win. There is every deal, it cannot be, the economics aren't perfect. So there is a winner 
and there is a loser, even in deals that appear to be you know fair and and meaningful, right? And so there, in social relationships, in deals, there's there's one person who is the most important, and one person who is the supplicant who is trying to get in the deal, and we're all wired to feel like the investor or the buyer right. is the prize that I'm trying to win, the Cracker Jack prize. That's where it comes from, right? I want to dig in this box and win the prize. I'm, I want to perform. I win in the prize. American Idol, right? I sing for the judges. Mm. The investor, we frame up in our mind as the person who will judge our performance and what it is we have against the other contestants in order to give us something, right? And so we, I feel like we need to break that frame and and frame ourselves as the prize. I'm the person that the buyer is lucky to be spending time with. I'm deciding if the buyer can get in my deal. I'm deciding whether to take the investor or not. So how do you organize that in your mind? Well, for my the, the way I feel about it and the way I, I organize the, the prize frame is that money is a commodity. I can get it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so if all the buyer can give me is money, and I can get money anywhere, the opportunity is to buy my product, to work with me, to invest in my deal. I'm the thing that, so money needs deals and money needs products to buy. And so I'm the thing that the buyer uh, prizes highly. I know more about my subject and my business than anyone. We work harder at it than anyone. If they go with a the competition, they're not gonna get as good a product and service as working with us. I'm fun to work with. I'm fair. If something needs to be done on a Sunday night, I'm there. You know, I'm fortunate on what I, I love to do. Don't stop when I'm tired. I stop when I'm done. Sometimes I bid things incorrectly. I still finish the work. Uh, and so the buyer or the investor is incredibly lucky to be working with me. We have the best product. I know this better than anyone else. And the only thing they can give me is money and I can get money anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so that organizes in my mind that I'm the prize. And they need to be doing things to prove that they're worthy of working with me. And so, so then you go, well, that seems, you know, maybe for you, you're established and everything. But what young people have to realize is that if you take a bad investor or you take a bad customer, it's worse than having no customer or no investor at all. They can you ruin go. your life. Thank you. They can mm -hmm. completely ruin your life. So it's true you do have to test you do have to interrogate. You do have to prove out the customer that he's gonna, you know, pay on time. That if he's gonna order large volumes, that he's gonna be there two years from now. You know, today in most businesses, you lose money, you know, on a transaction, even in the car business. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the first transaction, you make money over time with that customer. If you choose a bad customer, right, and he only lasts two or three months, you know, you have the potential to lose money. So. We do have to uh, uh, commoditize the buyer and recognize that our time, our product, our ability is the prize in the relationship. And some of our listeners right now are going, well, wait a second, I'm not in the deal business. I, I don't really understand why social yeah. skills podcasts were talking about this, but yeah, yeah, these yeah. frames that you're talking yeah. about are the same thing that we do mm -hmm. when we're pitching ourselves to the yeah. opposite sex or we're yeah. pitching ourselves to friends. We yeah. talk about power and status, but motivation of not being lonely, of having someone to marry, having friends in my life is also a very powerful motivator. And the frames that you talk about in the book, you know, starting first with that fun, right? Your mentor taught you that having a sense of humor, even in a room where there's billions of dollars on the line and there are people with higher status, your ability to come in and inject humor breaks that tension, starts to build a little bit of trust, starts to win them over, even if it's slight. And in teaching this for over a decade now, that is the exact same frame we talk about when we're socializing. People are out to have a good time. People want and expect a good time. And if you come supplicating, needy, trying to get fun from someone else, well, they're not interested. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, yeah, how I think it applies to every social situation is when when you come in and are um, asking for anything, emotion, when you're asking for your validation, when you're asking for money, uh, 
it makes you lower on the dominance hierarchy. So some ways I think about it like this, and this is in the new book as well. Uh, if you go back 250, 300,000 years into forming societies, you were born and you had two jobs to live to the age of 13 to 15. That was job one, right? And people around you tried to help you do that. And that was not a sure thing, right? Your second job was to procreate and have an offspring. So, so to, to um, expand the gene pool, right? After that, you were completely useless to society. And the thing you would be given to do would be either uh, as, a, as a soldier or as a workman, right? And so 25% of the male population was cleared off the bottom of the society every year. It was the bottom of the social food chain, of the social ladder, of the dominance hierarchy was the worst place to be. And so it, we started to form in our minds the urgency for moving up the social hierarchy, the dominance hierarchy, because the bottom of the dominance hierarchy what meant um, um, almost certain death, misery, yep. death, disease, decrepitness, stress, stress yeah. short life, hunger, uh, did I leave anything out? Um, Big recovery. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> the, you know, this is not where the food was. This is not where the women was. This is very miserable. Um, there wasn't autonomy. It was a miserable existence at the bottom of the food chain. So what you started working on immediately, and this became the highest order uh, of business for a human being, was to move up the social hierarchy. So anybody who seems like they will uh, bring you down or are lower than you, you did not want to um, coordinate with or collaborate with. You were trying to move up the social hierarchy, right? And if somebody appeared to be uh, slightly below you or below you, you wanted to stay clear of them in your clawing your way up the social ladder. And so when you come in and you act needy or you feel like you're going to take energy, you're going to take emotion, or you don't have things to give, or you don't have relationships to offer, or you don't have um, uh, things to, to give and, and benefit, then you appear to be low on the dominance hierarchy, and people want to steer clear of you as they claw, climb, scratch up the, the social ladder to the top where things are easy, where the women are, where the food is, where the money is. And the second frame that we talk about after sort of breaking that ice and having some fun is challenging. So when we're socializing, a lot of us try to seek rapport immediately, right? You talked about this example of small talk and walking into the boardroom. Well, it's the same when we're out mm -hmm. socializing and meeting people. We want to instantly find that rapport so we can feel like we're in and now we're safe and everything is good. But that actually works against you. You start supplicating, you start chasing other people's value, their attention, their approval, their acceptance, and all of a sudden, the other person's like, you know what? You're pulling me down the social dominance hierarchy yeah. here. I'm moving in the opposite direction of yeah. where I want to be. Yeah. Or you can, you can also feel uh, the neediness of them pulling from you, of, of seeking this rapport, which puts you in a bad position. And the first thing you want to do in, in that situation, if it's socially in boardroom, is get out. Yeah, and, and I think we were talking in uh, normal life as well. I mean, I have a problem because my family or my friends will be like, oh, you're framing me, you're controlling me. And, 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 and some of it's hard to do it all the time. And it's, it's um, what they're detecting is I'm just naturally trying to add fun, add value, be insightful, lift everybody up and, and everything like that. Um, but I'm good at it because I have to do it professionally and I – can sort of create the outcomes I want very naturally. And so um, the, the, the people closest to me will say, you're, uh, you know, again, you're, you're framing me and everything yeah, like that. I, but uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to do the best for everyone. I, I had that question because obviously the book has lots of examples of setting the power frame and challenging people in, you know, some would deem even like uncomfortably crazy like eating someone's sandwich grabbing an apple from someone who's, <laughs> who's in the middle of enjoying it so obviously there's this this plethora of frames or plethora of power frame that we could work with but you know this in its nature and deal making is a little adversarial you know how do you deal with your spouse and your kids when you know 
obviously going for the power frame is not going to win you much favor in the household. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, so, so one of my key topics is conflict. All right. And so I am constantly creating and solving conflict because you can't have any good, you can't have a 30 second commercial that's good. You can't have a three minute uh, video. You can't have a movie. You can't have a TV show without generating conflict so it can be resolved. So I'll tie this back into humans as well. The Whenever you hear about human conflict or you see people fighting or arguing, or it draws our attention immediately. So if you hear two people are outside in the office, you know, fighting, you, I don't sure. care what you're doing, you're doing, you're in a million dollar Bitcoin trade. You're like, ah, you know, you got to run outside and see what this fight is about. Right. Um, the, the, the best shows generate conflict that then needs to be resolved. So humans are attracted to conflict and pay attention to it because it is a simulation for uh, arguments and life situations that we want to learn about how people resolve conflict without having to be in it, right? Because it was in, in the past, again, 200,000 years ago, uh, uh, it was extremely dangerous to be in any kind of conflict with any other human, right? Because the way we resolved conflict is by killing each other. 25% of the entire male, male population, as I said, was wiped off the face of the earth every single year that time. So anytime you saw conflict, you immediately rush to and see how those people resolved it as a sort of simulation engine. So you would know when you got into a similar kind of conflict, how you could get out of it. So conflict attracts us immediately and creates attention. So when I see people come in and pitch deals as young people, old people, medium people, the, the, um, the, the thing that's missing is tension. It's right. The deal is sweet, saccharine, sticky. Everything's beautiful. It's nirvana. Uh, nothing is going to go bad. It's a perfect product for the perfect market, for the perfect people with the perfectly terrible non-existent competition at the perfect price point with huge margins. And, and it's all idealistic, right? Uh, and so that's sweet. And then when you, um, there's no tension. And so if you think about any joke, any story that you have uh, has, has three steps to it, right? It's got setup, path to payoff, and payoff. Whenever you look at a path to payoff in a joke, in a movie, in a TV show, that is about creating tension, right? So payoff or satisfaction is about resolving tension. Any deal that you propose, any relationship that, you start to enter has got to have some tension so it can be resolved for satisfaction. That is why, you know, if you're watching a movie and a guy goes up to the bar and he says to a, you know, says to a woman, Hey, can I buy you a drink? Oh, that's a beautiful dress. Um, you know, what are you doing in town? And, and the woman responds, Oh, hi, my name is Susan. Nice to meet you. Anybody who's ever been in a bar goes, that doesn't happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Except to Brad Pitt or whatever, maybe not even to Brad. Like that's not how it works. Right. So, so if there's nothing, no conflict, no tension, um, nothing to resolve, then humans don't have anything to do in a relationship and in a deal, in a relationship, there has to be uh, some tension, some conflict. Now, uh, you know, that can be ta can't be taken as aggressive or mean or, um, you know, deprecating or, or cruel, but it gives something to discuss, right? Um, so, so whenever you see a relationship that hasn't worked out, ask yourself, you know, was there a setup? Sure. Was there conflict? And then was the conflict resolved and I bet the conflict was missing so with your spouse and kids you're constantly setting conflict yeah and waiting for the resolution uh, um, I do yes it is one of the uh, criticisms of my personality is I uh, create conflict around the house so we can have fun and resolve it and uh, yes for sure so what's an example of a, a recent conflict that uh Maybe have gotten you in a little hot water. Uh, well, I mean, I think we talked about it earlier. So, you know, I, I built uh, this monster truck for our four-year-old. And, and I remember it, it came around the corner 
Uh, it was his, it was his birthday. It was three, and um, and we you know, I had somebody drive it up, and I got come on guys, come outside. And the monster truck drove around the corner, and it showed up. And my wife and our then three year old looking at it, and the three year old's going nuts, right? And he's so happy. And uh, my wife looks at it, and she looks at me, and she goes, "That better be a rental." <laughs> Uh, and, and but you know, uh, keeping her on her toes. Well, I think a, a lot of people hear conflict and immediately they go, oh, yeah, I, right. I have to avoid that, right? Yeah. That's the right. last thing I want. It goes back to the supplicative frame that that proceeds through deal making, through meeting someone for the first time, whether it's flirting or even trying to win friends, right? We We want to prove ourselves to them. We want to be agreeable by nature. We have to avoid conflict. But the best deal makers, the best charismatic people person, uses conflict to their advantage. They can mix up conflict and use it in a way to create a tension, create that tension that everyone feels that allows them to move things forward. So uh, I'll give you a little tool that uh, that I use with, uh, so I have quite a lot of friends who are very wealthy, uh, they don't have a lot of time, and you know, I like to stay in touch with them. and. That, you know, don't really have time to hear about my little boy, and he want, you know, he's ice skating, he's he's, he's uh, in hockey. Uh, you know, we had a birthday party. It was Father's Day. He made me waffles. Like they have their own kids and their own lives, and so, but we like to touch base. And so, I always use one-upmanship with them because it's fast, it's high conflict, it's fun, it's high stakes. And so I will call, and this is great, uh, I will call uh, m my friends who are in finance who are specialist cake decorators, right? I saw this on um, Orange County Choppers. Gotcha. Right? Because they're like the real uh, motorcycle manufacturer, like welders, and would criticize Orange County guys as cake decorators. Like you just order parts and bolt them on. So, so I love that. And so, uh, you know, I, I call like uh, my a guy who uh, buys... Um, hotels and office buildings and I'll go oh hey so how's cake decorating like yeah you buy it uh, you know you put a new entranceway in and then you sell it cake decorating like I'm doing real business right and so they know you're not really insulting them but it's high so so start calling your friends and your business associates you just want to do a quick check-in and say how's cake decorating <laughs> right and um, they'll be a, sort of a little bit irked and they'll come back with something yeah right? they're and, always responding yeah, right always that responding. tension gets filled so like I have to keep touch with three or four hundred guys who are all worth more than fifty million dollars, and they really don't care what I'm doing, my accomplishment, and that I'm keeping a dream journal or have a vision board or we're gonna launch a website or doing a blog or I got a new camera. Like you know, they're doing their own things. Like you know, so I'll I'll go. Oh, hey, are you still flying around that Hawker Four? Right. Like um, I saw one flying overhead, but it's so hard to see those. Like even when they're flying low, but I squinted. I thought. Anyway, what's what are you what are you up to? You know, or I'll just go. Um, uh, you know, how's that cabana in Malibu, right? Or whatever it is they're doing, I just try and minimize it sure. and and tweak them. And I think you do that with your good friends anyway, naturally. But that engages them shortly. They remember you. It's a big spark. Cake decorating. It's so. it's funny. <clears throat> uh, we we were talking about this earlier this morning at the gym, and there's two parts to this. Like for one. So a lot of this communication is being lost nowadays with all the, with all the tech and we're losing the, the nuance and you know you might have to send a winky face or 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 the smiling emoji just for them to get it but to me this is that the the madman of being in the office of being able to give each other shit and understand it that this is all part of that game and we're we're losing that nuance with all the technology that we're communicating with now which can be difficult. The other thing we were talking about today was that when somebody is learning this trick or trying to bring that into their personality and, and, and use it, they, they tend to, it's the pendulum swings from not having it to now working with it and find themselves uh, getting bounced out of a lot of places or having a hard time applying it because they've, that nuance is a difficult thing to, to learn. So, I, right, I find people, the folks who work for me, I have to train them to be, maybe the word is not more aggressive, but to be, um, use this more familiar form of communication with our guys we're trying to sell or with our new clients that they're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. 
right? It's so you do this with your friends or you do yeah. this with your buddy from college, but the uh, you know the account that could bring you a hundred thousand dollar commission. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Please, really appreciate it. We'll get right back to you. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to call today. Really appreciate you coming and all this sort of supplicating behavior, right? And so what I try and teach them is here's a good one that that uh, we use quite effectively, right? So if we have a call set with a potential new client and it could be worth a couple million bucks, uh, and you know as they always do because they think they're so important, they'll dial in at ten oh four, right? And uh, so I'll go, hey guys, welcome. Are you here for the ten oh four call? <laughs> right? The ten o'clock call started a while ago, but so you're here for the ten oh four call? Is that right? And and they'll react to it, and they'll recognize. So so the way to understand what you can and can't do mm-hmm. is through the moral authority frame. The way to introduce conflict or tension is when you frame somebody or their actions or behavior outside the norm. When you occupy the social center, norm, straight down the fairway, b- b- uh, straight line, things the way it's always done, the, the normal behavior, coming to a call on time, um, coming to a meeting and bringing somebody coffee, you know, going to going somewhere uh, for dinner and bringing them a bottle of wine. And we have social norms. We have mm-hmm. business norms. You know, coming to a meeting prepared, uh, having your laptop, you know, powered up. And there's just there's a million things that are normal. And the way to jump on somebody is when they're doing slight something outside the norm, right? And then they completely understand it's fair game. And they come back and go, oh, yeah, yeah, we're sorry. We'll do it better next time. So literally, you want a billionaire to say sorry to you within two minutes of meeting with you, right? Say, really? You couldn't find a parking spot, right? You want us to do a $100 million deal with you, and you couldn't find a parking spot, right? We're not encouraged. And it, 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 it's a way of being collegial, fun. It's behavior you have with your friends, but you have to frame the behavior as being outside the norm, and then you can get away with almost anything. I, so I think it's funny that a lot of people, you know, when they get called out for doing something that's outside the norm, or that being late, even with Jesse came, he was stuck in traffic, he was late, he felt so bad, he's like, I owe you guys any time, <laughs> we're gonna hang out. And it's 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 great to always have that in your, your pocket, it's certainly gonna be an edge up in that boardroom. I was here early today, we heard did a meditation tape. We had to wake you up, actually. So <laughs> yeah, reset. I have these incredible. You buy your morning, <laughs> afternoon coffee. I've got all this accoutrement for resetting, <laughs> because my, I live somewhat in finance, a somewhat stressful life. But I have these resets. That I can only imagine. But if I'd come late, I would have said, "Who sets a meeting in Los Angeles at four <laughs> o'clock? Right? Next time I do anything with you, it's eleven o'clock or no time. Right? So, I mean, that's that's fair. Like it's a horrible time." To, to So to, that, that frameworks both ways because yeah. now you're kind of pushing back on the other person. And I think this is where when people are listening to this, it's like, I, I could do this with Johnny. Johnny's my friend, yeah. right? I can bust his chops right. all day. I know that he's still going to like me. But when I'm meeting someone for the first time, uh, when there's a deal on the line, mm. there's hundreds of millions of dollars, I can't bust that guy's chops. But this combination of the fun, challenging frame that we talk about on the social side is that exact same thing. And you talk later in the book about frame stacking and how when you can get good at stacking these frames together, For sure. you can be very effective in the deal room and we say socially. <laughs> I think for, for people listening, the big one is the power frame, which is everybody's experienced that. It's the guy who barely responds to the highlights of your deal or your presentation or the, your your interaction uh, sort of grunts or really just wants information. Hey, we just want the information. And we all deal with that. Um, you know, a lot of times it's the analyst, a lot of times it's the investors, it can be the CEO of a company. Uh, and so they're sort of lording over you and they're not giving to me sort of normal reciprocation in the relationship. That to me is the is the power frame. They are feel and are exhibiting behavior that says they're more important than you. Um, they're not participating in a, in the conversation. So you may 
present a, a, a great feature of your software that makes most people go, ooh, ah, that's amazing. And they may say nothing or go, yeah, please continue. You know, so that's the power frame. And so uh, you it sort of leaves you two choices if you don't know what you're doing, and that is to just become the supplicant and fall into, oh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll continue. You know, sure. So you get that point. Uh, or we'll continue. Do you have any questions? Uh, you know, and and keep with the presentation and fall into the person trying to impress them. Uh, and the other thing people fall into is coming up directly in combat with it, sort of like power frame to power frame, and and saying something like, "Hey, um, you know, it's important that we get feedback on this item before we can continue, right?" And then they'll say, "You could do what you want. I have another fifteen minutes." Right? Yeah. You can stand on your hands, light your feet on fire if you want, but you got 15 <laughs> minutes to do it. Then I got a jet. Right? And so that's how the, the power frame would come back, and you would just be in argumentation. My sense of the way to deal with or combat or overcome or break the power frame is through the expert frame. Right? And that is when you, uh, when you have an expertise that somebody needs and doesn't have, then they will. Uh, th they don't have any power or control over you, and so when you combine that with the ability to move forward, discussing your expertise without needing their um, appreciation, without needing their acceptance, without needing their um, um, sort of social cues that you're doing well, then you will. Um, bring them over to your side. When you're the expert in what you do, nobody nobody really knows the one thing that you do better uh, than than whatever it is than you do, and you don't for a while need them to display attention to you. Then you can overcome the power frame. So you think about it, there's the prize frame, there's the power frame, there's the expert frame, there's the analyst frame, and these are all things that I've named. But you can name these scenarios yourself, and you can't really deal with it until you name it. <clears throat> and sort of saying, hey, that was a tough sale. That's not a name, right? Yeah, right. That's just a, um, a, 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 you know, a label of challenge, right? That was a one. That was a five. That was, that was a ten. But give names to these situations, and then you can start to figure out socially how to deal with them. And – when it comes to the power frame and you're in a situation in the boardroom like that, you know, we talk about stronger frame dissolves a weaker one. Yeah. And when people hear that, they think, again, I got to bash this person right. with my power frame and yeah. we got to fight over how many minutes we have left in our calendar and who's more important. And then nothing happens. Yeah. And in those situations, when you're in that deal room, one, how quickly are you assessing what the frame is, who's these, who these characters are? And two, uh, is there something that you do religiously to set that frame before the other person can set the power frame? Is that something that comes to mind of like, I got to be there first? So I think that uh, in a room where there's multiple players on their side, and if it's one of you or you know, a group to a group or you presenting to a group, the way I would answer that is you have to find a peer on their side. That's so the the peer is someone that you can have open, direct, collaborative, high stakes, sometimes in conflict, sometimes in agreement conversation. Right? So you have to organize their group into classical dominance hierarchy positions. So they will have Typically, at least in the deals I'm in, they will have a CEO, they will have the business development guy, they will have the lawyer, they will have some woman, you have no idea who she is, right? And then they'll have a couple analysts. And so you have to think about how to treat and organize all these people to really your benefit. So the CEO, you will be, you will have deference to, right? That's the way to treat him. Um, the you find a peer and you will have direct high conflict high stakes conversation with them. With the analysts, you will um, n not be dismissive of them, but you will um, uh, 
be complimentary of them because they're going to be trying sure. to disprove the things you're saying mm -hmm. and you'll be complimentary of them of the person you don't know who they are uh you know you'll be sort of testing and trying to figure out who they are and with the lawyers you'll be trying to reframe them be somewhat dismissive of them oh you brought the lawyers that's awesome i love lawyers anytime i want to spend four hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> in like a week to get a two-page document i already have i call in the lawyers i'm so glad you're here yeah right ceo it's terrific that you're here i know you're running a company right and we'll free to leave at any time i promise i will not negotiate hard against your awesome team here so if you have other things to do i totally understand um i promise i won't take advantage of the team right so so deference to them and not take them on um with the peer uh you know say hey i looked at you know i looked at your linkedin um you know, I, I would pick on something there. Uh, it looks like you've been in business development here for three years, right? Is there, you know, you couldn't bring the five-year guy? Where's he, right? Or do I just have to work with you? I've been doing this for 10 years. Now I got a three-year guy that I'm working with. I'll try and help you along with this, right? And and so that is, that's the high tension, right? With the analyst, hey, I'm glad you guys are here, right? You're going to find things that I say that are not right. Right, and and absolutely, I'm not going to argue with you. Right, you're going to poke holes in the spreadsheet. You're going to poke holes in our numbers. You're going to poke holes in my market data. And I'm, you're the smartest. You know, I'm, I'm looking at you guys. First of all, like dress impeccably. You're on the smartest guys. You went to good schools. I did not go to a good school. I don't have these analytical skills, and I defer to you. The things that you're going to point out, I agree. We have done wrong. We will try to fix and no disagreement. And by the way, I'll have my analysts um, you know, meet up with you when they have an hour or two hours and you guys can focus on the, the books and the numbers. So that's how you start to organize all those people ahead of time so they don't interrupt you or disrupt um, the meeting and you've got to, in essence, pigeonhole them and put them into place. That's how I would control a room just walking into it. Um, there was something interesting there I wanted to point out, and I don't know if it was just something you were just saying as you were going through this, or if there was a particular reason, but I, if there is, I think I might be able to see it. But <clears throat> when it was the business developed guy, you chose to fuck with him a bit, but you built up the, the analysts a bit. That's right. Was there, so was there a reason why? Yeah, those, you went those guys, so they can only make themselves look good by poking holes in gotcha. your numbers, your presentation, the things you say, disproving your facts. And so they, in fact, the analysts uh, or the junior people are going to make themselves look good to their boss by finding holes in your logic or finding something, right? So when you say, uh, hey, guys, you're going to find things in this presentation that I've done wrong there, you're going to poke holes in our numbers and you're gonna find things that are probably categorically incorrect. I agree with you. You're way smarter than we are. You know this stuff. Uh, um, you, you know, you're highly analytical. We're, for this first meeting, we're trying to give you the general gist of what we're doing, but I promise you, um, by the end of the deal, we will do what you say, and we'll be in alignment with you on the numbers, and we agree with you. And you're sort of taking the frame, there, deflates away right it deflates their Def yeah. excitement to to, to find those holes well what's funny about that and socially when the, we'll get one of the questions we get asked a lot a guy will usually if it comes to like he's out maybe he's interested in a certain girl in a group he's like well how do i let her know and 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 deal with her friends who are trying to maybe get me away or or mess with me and what we always say is is compliment the friends and give a hard time to the one that you're interested yeah. in so yeah. that their guard is now coming down and he's all right but yet she's still trying to figure out why you're messing with her yeah i, I agree i mean we had a ceo that for no reason uh at, you know at a coffee shop he would berate the barista like, yeah what do you mean you don't have cinnamon like to what's the sport <laughs> you know they already you know it's a 24 year old kid working at a coffee shop Obviously, he doesn't want to be there. You know, he looks like a cool guy, and he's doing it to make money or put himself through college or maybe he had a kid or whatever. Where's the sport in attacking that guy, right? And so it's the same thing with the analysts. It's, um, you know, treat the younger guys with deference. Give them credit 
for what they're good at yeah. ahead of time and tell them that they're right. So lawyers will do this, right? They'll, the, if they have a you know a rough client, they'll say, "You look at my client, right? And you're going to say, you know, this is the Eminem uh, <laughs> song opening, right? You're going to look at my client, and you're going to say he's a derelict, you know, that he that he uh, you know lives in a trailer park, gotcha. that he's a drunk, that he's a sometimes drug user, right? That he has 17 felonies on his record." Um, that he came to court late today, right? And you're going to look at all these things and you're going to see that, right? And we admit to it freely. We're going to show you another side of him that you may not be able to see at face value. You know, whatever. So you, so you want to, um, for, for those analysts, you, uh, you want to give them deference and raise them up a little bit and um, you know, treat everybody in everybody in the room has a position and an archetype, and you have to think about it. So you've got you know again the CEO, business development. You got the lawyers. You got the analysts. You got the unknown consigliere. Um, you have the secretary. And uh, it's funny that's how I got my book deal with Pitch Anything because I walked in to the publisher, and they very very obviously the um, the lead editor of a large New York publisher is matronly. She's older. She ha just has the look of a, you know, New York educate New York educated, published academic journal. You could just feel the difference between the editor, you know, and all the other young people in the room. And I walked in and uh, I say, you know, I, I point to her and I go, thank you so much for setting up the appointment. The, um, you, you know, your emails have been great. You're one of the best admins, you know, that we've ever had. And uh, I can't wait to meet the person in charge because, you know, for as good as you are, the, the editor must be terrific. Sure. When, when do we get to meet her, right? And she got all fluffed and the, the young people got all, uh, you know, tittering and everything. And they're like, he's doing it, he's doing it. And, and so it, it, you know, created fun for everybody. So you don't want to fall into, you want to, don't, you know, we say you don't want to fall into the frames that are preset mm -hmm. for you, where you're supplicating to the leaders, you are um, combative with the analysts, right? The lawyers are interrupting you and you allow them to interrupt. So you want to get all this set up correctly to work for your deal. Or your and that's just it. When, when we break those patterns, we stand out. Everyone that you talked to in that meeting, the analyst came that morning knowing that I'm gonna poke some holes in this, I can't wait to show the CEO how on top of this deal I am. And you've just not only managed to set the frame for everyone else, but all that gusto is gone, right? Now they're ready to be entertained, they're ready to pay closer attention to the deal. So, so, so that's, I think, you know, a huge subject for me is you, in a deal or in a business presentation, your job is infotainment. Deliver the information, but you need to give somebody information, put it in a FedEx packet, mail it to them. That's how you get information to someone or attach it to an email. People come to meetings to learn, get real insight, meet new interesting people, hear novel ideas and advance their uh relationships and their knowledge of the world and be entertained. And so I think of these presentations as a performance. And so they should, you know, if you, if you think about a comedian, the best comedians you see, you feel like he just strolled on stage. He's he just off the cuff riffing sure. off this material. But if you watch him practice, right? Oh, yeah. it, we've it, seen Jim Jeffries two years before some of his stuff made air that he was working on so a lot of time and care goes into that whole show right right i mean it's uh you know what the secret of great comedy is ask me what's the secret of great comedy what's timing <laughs> okay gotcha <laughs> so 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 um uh, you know this is a performance and that's why i try and teach people is that um buyers want information in the order that the questions come up in their mind that is your presentation, not the things that you want to say. Mm -hmm. It is when you know what order to say things and how to manage the frame, then then they don't ask questions. Like people will say, "Hey, Warren, what do you do when somebody asks a question in the middle of a presentation?" And uh, uh, you know, I was recently asked that, and I'm like, I, "I don't know. Why don't I know? I should know this." And I go, "Because oh, I haven't been asked a question happen. in the middle of a presentation in ten years." 
It just doesn't happen because I give, first of all, you know, a couple things going on. One is I view it as a performance. Sure, absolutely. Every time I give it, it gets better. I think about how to make it more. And uh, so that's one. Uh, it's a performance when I'm giving people the information, answering the questions that come up in their mind in the order that those questions pop up. Uh, I am raising the questions that are uh, the obvious skepticism. I'm not waiting for the end where they go, oh, I'm so, well, is this even legal to do? You know, it, uh, you know if, it's, if it's, there's an obvious question that you know you're going to get, I'm putting that up front and saying, I know what you're going to, I know what you're thinking. Is this even legal? Right? We had that question as well. So we went out and we, you know, we got attorneys and we, uh, you know, we spent six months figuring it out. Turns out it's not legal in Florida. Right? But in California, where we're out, where we are, you can actually do it. You know, whatever it is. So, you, um, the the presentation is a performance. You're asking the questions that pop up in the mind of the buyer, the investor, the you know, as they as they come up, uh, and you're managing these frames that we've been talking about, and that's what makes a great pitch presentation, whatever you want to call it. In in what we teach at the Art of Charm, the frames fun challenging and the last one is is leader because at this point you got them opened up everyone's feeling a little comfortable laughing now you've stood up for yourself you've pushed back in a playful way but you let them know that hey i have a backbone i'm not supplicative then there's always this well what do we do next and a lot of us yeah. don't step into that tension and say well i'm going to actually tell you what to do next yeah. i'm going to make sure that we actually take that next step do you find that it's the same when you're pitching deals so i think it's more uh, prominent or accentuated or it's a bigger problem because you give the pitch typically you'll get all your information out all, you'll give out all your objective information so people give out all their objective information out because it's the easy stuff like we know what our product does <laughs> right we know uh, how it works we know that Microsoft says it's great um, we know our performance you know we can show the demo so all the objective information comes out then the subjective information comes out. That's the nuance. People say it's great. I know it will work for you. Um, here's the, um, you know, here's a reference. And this is all the things that add, uh, that where you're trying to trying to stoke desire. But then you get to the point where you're done. All your objective information, all all your rapport is done. Your networking, people we know in common. Uh, oh, you like skiing. I like skiing. You fish in Florida. I fish in Florida. Oh, your sister went to UCLA. My sister went to UCSD. Maybe they know. Like all that stuff is out. Then you've given out all your objective information. Then you've used all of your subjective um, formulas and nuances. But so then you get to a point where you go. So what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? Do you have any questions? And that is exactly the problem. That transition is when the buyer takes over. Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, nope, no questions. Really appreciate you presenting. Very interested. Uh, we, you know, we have to do something like this. We're really excited about meeting you. You seem to be like one of the best. Pricing seems really fair. Once you send us all the information and we'll talk amongst ourselves. I talk yeah. to my wife. We'll talk to our partner. We'll go to committee. We'll talk to the board. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and we'll get back to you. And then they disappear. And now you're chasing them again, you know. Uh, and so that is the problem that when you get to the end of your presentation, no matter how well you've done it, if you don't know how to continue it, then you're hosed because buyers just want to, they have all the information they need. Mm -hmm. They largely know the price. Um, they don't need you anymore and they just, and they're tired. And they have other things to do. They just want to go away. And so basically they're saying, thanks, appreciate the information. And, and so the question is, what do you do at that point that doesn't transfer all the power over to them? And they just go, thanks, we need to go. We've seen it happen so many times um, when it comes to uh, getting a job, networking, uh, getting a date where you know the guy will do all this work, get the girl interested or or get somebody interested in going to meet for coffee to, to, to work together. And all the entertainment's been done, all the information's given, and then it comes down to, so so if you wanna hang out sometime, then we just can give me your number and I'll give you a ring. Yeah, yeah. It's just so, like, why are you gonna do all that work and then and give that person the ball? 
It's, yeah, like, you, you have to lead. Yeah, and it's, it's not questions at that point. It's clear statements. All right, so I'll be checking in. I'm going to be sending over mm -hmm. the contract next week. We'll get things signed up. All right, we're going to be grabbing coffee uh, next week, Tuesday. Looks like we're both clear. One of the things that I've always said about that is you've done all this work where there is rejection going to be all the way through that, and they haven't done it. So push through that last bit of where that rejection could be. They haven't done it yet. So what makes you think they're going to do it at that point? I made a really nice video, never meet in coffee shops. Because right? <laughs> my understanding, you know, from your world, uh, never meet for coffee because what is going to, you know, on a date, what is going to happen at a coffee shop? Yeah. N you know, nothing is going to happen at three in the afternoon at Starbucks. I guarantee you, right? Things happen at like 1030 at night, right? In your apartment, but not, but, but, um, and for business, you know, in all seriousness, like these are the worst possible environment for a real presentation mm -hmm. to happen or pitch sure. or trying to move something forward. There's all kinds of people walking around. You're sitting in these tiny little like um, uh, midget chairs, you know, ch <laughs> kids chairs. Um, there's, if, if you're in an area that the buyer and the investor, this happens all the time when I used to do coffee shop meetings, somebody will come up and go, oh, hey, Frank, and they'll just talk to that guy for 10 minutes and you're sitting there not sure. knowing what to do because they have a better relationship. And then they go, oh, I only have five minutes left. I mean, th these coffee shop environments are terrible for business presentations. Um, you know, not bad, get get to meet you and get, you know, get to know you for a business guy, they're, they're not bad, but they're they're bad environments. But so, so what do you guys recommend? And we'll compare and contrast our methods. So you give a presentation, right? Get all the objective information out, all the subjective information out, you've given all the compelling stuff and then where do you go from there? Yeah, to, to my point of that fun, challenging, the leader steps in and now you're making clear directive statements that allow the other person to know very clearly what the next steps are. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. once they are excited, most of us just need to know, okay, well, what can I do next? How can I take that action? And it's the same thing in sales, mm -hmm. you know, as you talked about, right? With a poor salesman is like, oh, how do I handle these objections? A smart salesman has already covered the objections at the start of the call, yeah. so that at the end of the call, there are no objections to go over. So it's the same across all of those lines in, in our mind and in, in the way that we frame things for our clients. So I'm more aggressive with it, and this is a script that I would give you, which is, so listen, AJ, I like you. It seems like this would be a perfect fit, this deal. Matter of fact, I'm from meeting you in the conversation, I'm really interested in the the possibility of us working together. But if you gave me a check right now, I'd hand it back to you. I don't know enough about you. How do you behave in a deal? You know, what other deals have you done? What has happened when those deals have gone sideways? You show up, you know, trying to help the deal. Do you put the jack boot on the neck of the uh, company? What are your, you know, do you really understand what an early stage company needs in terms of time frame? What are your time frames? You know, who are your associations? What, you know, what deals have you been in that has gone bad and that have gone good? I, I just tell me about yourself. I don't know enough about you to say I'm ready to spend the next three years with you as my customer, you as my investor. And so that challenge. Yeah, you just will, set the buyer frame. Now you're yes. the buyer, they have mm -hmm. to sell to you. They're in the lower value position. So if you give a crappy presentation, supplicate, have everything out of order, not sure where you are, winging it, take a long time and have no knowledge of frames, and then you do that as perfectly as they can be done, as it can be done, they'll say, what, what are you talking about? That's, <laughs> you're annoying me right now, right? <laughs> Absolutely. If you give a performance, yeah, it's done within 15 or 20 minutes. You answer the questions that are in their mind in the order they're having them. The big idea, how things are changing, what the problem is, what your solution is, what it is specifically, how it works, what the key assumptions are, uh, what the pro forma or the upside is, what the downside protection is, what the team is, and a little bit about other people that use it or who thinks you're good. You do all of that correctly in 15 minutes uh, and you manage the frames and you give a professional presentation that communicates, I'm in the hand, I'm in the hands of a professional. And then you say to the buyer or the person you're working with, but I just don't know enough about you. Then you have challenged them through the quality of your presentation to present back to you. And they don't have a presentation to give. So they start fumbling around. 
starting to come up, you know, it's almost like a, a one of these uh, uh, dance offs, right? Sure. Right. Now <laughs> like, they got to figure out reasons yeah. that you should work with them and they weren't prepared. It's to come up to your level. To, it's to come up to your story level, storytelling level that you've established. They want to, they, you've lowered, in, in that micro environment, you've lowered their social status to below you. You are a great storyteller. You've got all your, you, uh, it's funny, you laugh, they cry. Uh, you got all the information in the right order. Uh, you know, you told a few jokes at the right time. You gave them new information. They're like, wow, you're an incredible storyteller. This is great information. And they have been lowered a little bit in social status. And when you lower somebody in social status, the number thing they want to do, the number one thing they want to do is get it back. Right. right? And bad. so now they're going to try and tell their story at the same quality that you told yours, but they won't be able to because you have practiced it, you've organized it, you know the frames, you know all the information. It's unfair. And they'll start fumbling around and, and trying to organize a story, winging it on the fly. It won't be as good as you. And you can actually help them tell their story and allow them to get their social status back to be a peer with you. That is uh, the the thing that really creates a you know at the end of your presentation somebody saying uh, coming in trying to work with you instead of saying I'm just going to leave thanks for the information. So we covered a lot of ground on the actual pitch, setting the frames, and all the parallels between socialization and winning the deal. And you talk in the book a lot about your preparation, right? In order to be even be ready to give that yeah. amazing performance, there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. You know, a lot of our listeners, they're not closing $100 million deals just yet, but they want to get in the door. They want to pitch their idea. They have this great uh, idea that they need funding for. What are your tips to them to get that pitch meeting? And is there yeah. something that you do first? And, and do you believe in the elevator pitch even? I mean, the elevator pitch is a little weird uh, in the way it's in all the old books. I would say today the way to get the meeting is certainly two things. Context and winter is coming. Winter is coming. We, you know, Everybody knows from Game of Thrones. So something is changing really dynamically in your world, right? And um, you have to... It, leave behind or stop doing some activities and prepare for this huge change because companies that aren't prepared and adopt it are going to get, um, you know, fall behind and be laggards in their industry and companies that get this right are going to sure. be the leaders for the next years to come. Right. Winter is coming. So if you don't have that, what winter is, you need it. The second thing is context, right? If somebody, so I have a pretty good media footprint, if I go out to dinner, somebody will walk up and say, please sign my girlfriend's boobs or whatever. But, um, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm recognized, uh, all over the world. And, uh, you know, just, uh, I get a lot of people every day emailing me, coming up to me, talking to me. And I just, I don't have enough time to give everybody attention. Sure. If somebody comes up and says, Hey, I read on your blog, but you know what you said about the dominance hierarchy. I know your book is dropping, um, in, uh, the spring of 2019, I pre-ordered it, and I really love what you said at minute 20 in your uh, uh, Art of Charm broadcast. Right? That's so much context. Like I know that it's not a, they're, they're not, not just coming in time. cold. Yeah. They're not going to waste my time. You know, there's some relevance there. And then they go, I jumped on your website and I saw that you're not in GPRA compliant, and that um, you know, it t there's a there's a 250 millisecond load time, which is like five times too slow to get, I bet your response rates on your website and signups would double if you could fix those two things. Yeah. Then I'm in. Yeah, like, I, I don't number. even know. I don't even know I'm being sold, mm. right? I just fall into that. I go, oh, really? How do we? Because there's that. context and, win and, and winter is coming. Something is changing. So, matter of fact, the better way to do that would be um, 250 um, so the new standard that Google is ranking on, C on SEO is 50 millisecond response time. Anybody who's got a 250 millisecond response is five times too slow for the new standard. And 
those sites are going to fall to page 10 of Google in one day. And anybody who's at 49 milliseconds, like a high frequency trader, is going to be the leader in their niche for the next two years. And then I'm just, there's nothing I can do. Right. You know, I'm just like, oh, boy, how do, Please, how do we work talk. together? The, right. The guy who pitched you, they certainly could have used that. Yeah. I, not to throw you under the bus, but I did a <laughs> Wicked Reports demo and I was actually waiting for you know, the simple benefits to me personally, it just started showing me someone else's dashboard, all these figures and numbers. And as somebody who runs the company, I'm like, I don't need to see someone else's dashboard. I just want to know what are the problems that I have and how are you going to fix them in a very straightforward way? And then tell me the price. price. Tell me how I actually make this happen. <laughs> 45 minutes, no price. He At the end of it, he goes, hey, if you have any questions, just go ahead and email me. I'm like, well, who gives a presentation expecting yeah. there to be questions at the end of it? You just wasted right. my time. Right. And now I don't trust your software. Yeah. So... Uh, I think, you know, this this falls into a lot uh, of the, you know, the training that salespeople have that might be in the manuals or sales managers is sort of this feature benefits um, type selling. So if you think about it, a feature is something that's objective and a benefit is something that's subjective, that's opinion, Right. And so what happens is when you do feature benefits, you say, you know, whatever, this microphone, it has this incredibly foam, sound absorbing foam. That means that your listeners will enjoy the presentation better. Uh, it's got this articulating arm and the arm means that it can be positioned perfectly for anybody's voice. That means your show will be um, uh, sound better to audiences and you'll have more downloads, right? And, uh, you know, as I'm saying this, you might, feel like frustration mounting, the electronics in the microphone uh, are noise deadening. So it doesn't pick up the uh, noise canceling. So all the movement of coffee cups and everything like that. Uh, and again, that means you'll get more downloads and um, the, the um, it'll sound better and people will like your show better, right? So the, the, the problem with this is we're bound, I don't know what the product is before you're asking me essentially to buy it. So it's much, uh, when we reorganize presentations, just tell the buyer in without any um, editorial or color or, uh, you know, emphasis what it is. Buyers want to know what it is. Then tell them why what it is is good for them, the value, and then ask them to buy. When you're going feature benefit, feature benefit, feature benefit, uh, the benefit is subjective, which is you're trying to get somebody to believe something that is not a fact. That means mm -hmm. you're selling them, right? So give all the features, then give all the benefits, roll that into a value proposition and say, what are we going to do? I like and, it. Yeah. And so I think uh, there's just ways that are outdated that are in all the books. And if you think of like, because because the books were... The books were built in a time where sales person, people, you know, and, and Dan Pink and everybody talks about this. There was a, a symmetry. The salesperson actually had information that you had to put up with a bunch of crap from a salesperson because they had information about the product you just couldn't get. Right. You couldn't go to the review site. You couldn't yeah. hop online and pull up all the other competition out there. So there was a lot more trust placed in the salesman. I, I think about it like this. Uh, you know, if you had a, a pencil salesman, you go, this pencil is the best pencil in the world. It draws a line, unbroken, two miles long. And the buyers are like, oh, wow, I don't know. Like, <laughs> two miles. That's, that seems like a <laughs> long. Sure as hell I'm not going to drive down to the county library and look that shit up. No. <laughs> I either have to believe him or not. <laughs> right Today, they're like, oh, no, according to Google, you know, the longest line drawn by a pencil is three miles long by the number two pencil company. Right, so, so they're fact-checking you. They, they come knowing information. So... Uh, there's much higher expectations on the quality and the conciseness of the information because they already know it. Yeah. And and so people can come to buy your stuff or do deal with you knowing more about your stuff in some ways than you do. You know, it's funny. I think one of the greatest, most well-known sales movies of all times is Glengarry Glenn Ross and that whole Alec Baldwin up front. And of course, then after that, you get just to see all these different types of pitches. You get to see... Uh, Jack Lemon being very supplicative. In fact, it's so supplicative. You're cringing into screen at all his moves. Um, you're you're watching Al Pacino be slick. 
uh, messing with the guy, um, getting him to laugh, getting him to open up body language wise, um, and all those different uh, sales pitches are in, are in there as well. The uh, I would recommend to everybody go to Google and type in Al Pacino soundboard. Oh yeah, it's great. It's there's there's two of them. They're amazing. You can basically construct the world's <laughs> greatest sales pitch. You have no supplicating. Right. Every response to a buyer's question can be driven by the Al Pacino soundboard. So if you want to get involved with this stuff and go, how do I not say please, thank you all the time, not supplicate to a buyer? This is great. Al Pacino soundboard is the answer. So all the salesmen and saleswomen Doom. go to the go. soundboard. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> We're big on body language. We yeah. believe that it's a huge part of communication. I know the studies vary and the numbers get thrown yeah. around a lot, but outside of the studies, we know the importance of body language. When it comes to the pitch, how aware of you, how aware are you of your body language and the body language in the room? So this is tricky. Uh, I am become a nat. I mean, I have people come up after my presentations and say, that was amazing. Can you teach me the body language? And I, do you guys know Roger Love? Yeah. yeah, you should have him on here. He's awesome. Okay. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a conference with Roger. He's a voice coach. Yeah, um, if you could pass his contact info. Yeah, we get asked for voice email. coach a lot too. He's he's terrific. So he's he showed me a lot. Uh, so so for example, I used to do a lot of Jesus like movements mm -hmm. where both my hands were in synchronicity, sure. and so he showed me that it doesn't really matter what you do with your hands as long as they're not in parallel because that makes you look like a politician. And it makes you look like a preacher, and so these kind. So as long as your hand movements are uh, asymmetrical, okay, it yeah. comes across as natural, powerful. Uh, and then the other thing is, I've let, you know, like you guys, I've done three hundred and fifty, maybe not podcasts, but we do a weekly hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. We give me a lot of time in front of the camera, a lot of time in front of the microphone, and then I speak from stage. So when I do presentations, people are like, "Who are you?" because right? they feel like they're getting a stage performance you know in a around a conference table so i think i have it a little bit unique but i would say uh the body i'm so i'm not that aware of it but people react to it and they like it uh and and so that is about getting reps and about having somebody there whether it's roger love as a voice coach to cure your tics and bad habits you know, we talked about the podcasting guy that was constantly reaching sure. for the microphone or anything. So and we all have them. We and have yeah. with our right. clients. We film them interacting right. socially yeah. with beautiful women. That is intimidating, and you know these things creep up subconsciously. We're not even aware of them because we're worried about what the other person thinks. When you see yourself on video, you start to pick up on these things. As you, I'm sure, have watched video of yourself on stage, you realize that you know some of these things I'm doing are not effective at all and making me look. The opposite of what I'm trying to come across. For sure, for sure. So uh, the the I'm very aware of it because it works for me really well. So and what about reading everyone else's body language? I know you're setting the frame. So if if someone is closing themselves off and and looking disinterested, are you trying to adjust their body language in any way? So one of the disadvantages I have in my business is we're always pitching something different. So I never really get to the point where I'm so much in control gotcha. of myself that I can start to monitor other people. I think about like, if you go to race motorcycles and the first time you ever get on a racetrack, like Willow Spring with a, with a performance motorcycle, you go, holy, I'm yeah. gonna die. Like every single minor variable is a major issue in your mind, yeah. right? And then, you know, you go around the track and you, you know, maybe have done that for a year or two years and all the things that freaked you out the first time, are, you set yeah. aside in your mind and you're only focusing on the really big variables that matter. And so I think about it in that context that the reps, every time you do a rep, it takes one more variable and parks it in the subconscious and you're not aware of it. And then eventually, you know, you're giving that pitch or giving that presentation or having that conversation in a way that you're not self-conscious, you don't have to self-monitor all the things you're doing. Now you can start to be observant of what other people are doing. And, um, and, and so I don't have the benefit of getting to that point in our presentations, because you know, I, a deal comes to me, I package it, we go present it 50, 30 times, you know, it finances, and then 
It's behind us, one. and we move on to the next one. Well, you but even I, you even mentioned it at the end of the book where it's okay. Now you read this, throw it out, and go out there and start pitching. It's reps, and we see it reps. all the time. People will come in. I've read all the books. I know. listen to the podcast. Uh, yes, I'm I'm watching your videos I, online. <laughs> And it's that. like, it, it, that all changes. Yeah, the, the boot camp mm, is 200 reps. It's built into yeah, the boot camp amazing. that you are getting those reps with the feedback you need to make mm -hmm. the major adjustments, not the minor ones. As you talked about, that motorcyclist on the course, right? There's so many variables, oh. and you're worried about the minor ones that have no impact on your ability to stay on the motorcycle. Same thing socially. Yeah. We can get so in our head and so worried about things that don't matter and I'm glad you pointed that out to the listeners because one of the things that they're always hyper aware of is reading other people's yeah. body language and thinking they can get inside their mind based on the way they're sitting. Nope. And science doesn't back that up. Nope. There are times where I'm going to cross my arms because I'm cold. And there are times where I'm going to cross my arms because I'm just not interested in what you have to say. I, I you know, I have, don't, <laughs> when you have a good presentation, you have a good conversation pattern or blueprint or rapport that works on the human mind, it basically works on most people or no people. So I think about like rock bands, mm -hmm. right? So so when you go give a performance, you don't go, oh, well now we're in Miami, so let's infuse a little bit of, like rock music works, because it fucking works. It, absolutely. Right? It brings something primal out in people. Well, and you right? also don't want to be reactive to where you are because yeah. that takes you off your game. You want to be yeah. fully ready to roll. Stronger frame themselves a weaker one. You want to be so uh, that that whole performance from top to bottom is mapped out. So we're reactive. I'm reactive after the presentation in the post analysis. You should have the great presentation capture speech of the ma people's imagination. It's a performance. You do it as well as it can be done yep. and you live with the outcome. Well, let's talk about that outcome because, yeah. you know, th there are these two opposing forces. We talked earlier about prizing, right? You want to frame yourself as a prize. You want to win. And with that, there's failure. You know, you are not going to win every pitch. As you said, some of these times you got to go out and pitch 30 times before the deal closes. Sure. How do you build up the tolerance for failure while keeping that prizing mindset? For me, it is knowing that we did, we prepared, did the best work possible, and we gave, I mean, my four-year-old has books from Pete the Cat. Do you, anybody here have kids? <laughs> no. no. Okay, you get it. And by the way, <laughs> never talk about kids, and uh, when, so when we fly the plane, right, if you go, if you mention your kids or your wife, people are like, ah, oh, right? If you go, oh, I'm bringing my girlfriend, they're like, oh, great, does she have any friends? <laughs> <laughs> So there's some, but so so anyway, our, you know, our little boy for it has a book called Pete the Cat, and that thing finishes up. Do your best, right? And that's all you can do. Yeah. He tried his best, and so I prepared. I didn't wing it. I really thought about what would be best for the other person, and I brought my best material, best performance, and tried to help them authentically. If that didn't work, I, I did the best I could do, right? I'm not going to change my values, my my value system, my integrity, or or uh, beg or supplicate. If it's not good enough, then it's not good enough. I did my best. I mean, that's the way you have to internalize it. I mean, if you want to get metaphysical, it's sort of you know. And I've had some down times in my life where you know that that's whenever you you know you don't pick up the metaphysical books when you're like, no. <laughs> I just closed a fifty million dollar deal. I bought my third Lamborghini and a helicopter, right? Oh, you're uh, God at that point. Let, you right, let me uh, pick up a copy of Ryan Holiday's uh, interpretation of Aesop Fables to learn about myself. Right? It's just like, oh my God, I have eleven dollars. <laughs> uh, you know, where? Uh, what do the Stoics say you should do? <laughs> but, he but, goes the enemy, right? Yeah, he goes <laughs> the you better enemy. pick like, this up. No, my <laughs> shitty business idea is the enemy. Um, so, but, but. At, at those times when I have looked at stoicism and asceticism, it's sort of been, um, um, you know, get through the day, uh, you, you do your best during the day, finish it up with you know, poise and calm, knowing you did what you could. And I think it can't get any more fancy than that. You can't get attached to the outcome if you did your best. And I, I'd love to wrap with, I would think, the biggest pitch of your life. How did you meet your spouse, and, and what oh, was man. the pitch there? Is, so I didn't know anything about 
this stuff. Uh, and she, and she's amazing. She's from Belize. Okay. Right. And uh, she's beautiful. A lot of people ask if are you Miss Belize? She's amazing, and she has a calm, patient personality, uh, which is funny. Our little boy is half of her and half of me. So he uh, uh, he plays hockey, which is like the world's you know, most one of the most aggressive sports oh, you yeah. ever see. He's very patient, skates very nicely, waits for the puck to come, you know, and then just shoots it in the goal. <laughs> and uh, uh, but but anyway, uh, she was a vendor to a company that I had invested in. And she came in, and I asked her name, and you know, got her phone number because I had her work phone number. And she just resisted wanting to go out, and I just kept chasing her, and so that made her not want to go out. And <laughs> uh, and then eventually, and, and and this is a big subject. And then eventually, we went out, and I heard this a lot during that part of my life: is oh, you're different than I thought. And to me, that subject is like the various pieces of me weren't integrated. So the how you talk to girls piece was different from the how you do business piece, which sure. is different from the how you hang out with your motorcycle buddies piece, which is different from the, uh, you know, how you hang out with your family piece. And so people pick up on that. And that has been the work that I've largely done is how do you integrate all these pieces? So there isn't a, uh, you know, the the sale, the ShamWow guy, and there isn't the nice guy, and there isn't the angel, and the wolf, and the sorcerer, and the storyteller, and I have all these different archetypes that are pieces of me, but that's when people say, hey, um, he seems inauthentic, is mm -hmm. it, it, you could still be a good person and trying hard, it's you've got all these, they're picking up on all these different archetypes that are reactive, right? And so if somebody thinks that in the part of the sale, um, the, you need to be the storyteller to, to tell all the pieces. Now you're the storyteller. Now uh, you're going for the close and you're the angel. So what do you think? Is it something you'd be interested in? Do you have sure. any questions? I really, you know, it's, it's been a great meeting. Then the objections or the questions come out. And now you're the wolf. Oh, well, you know, we don't have budget. Let me tell you, you know, budget's not an issue. So now you're the wolf, right? And, uh, and so when you are being reactive with different archetypes, people... Uh, feel like you're inauthentic. So with her, you know, I was, you know, super nice and hey, do you want to go out? It'd be really nice to see you. But that's not who she saw when she came to see the office. She saw somebody negotiating a vendor really hard. And so it wasn't until we got to spend some time together that she said, oh, you're different from who I thought you were. And that's that's a bad sign. Um, and so uh, that's that's how right here we met in Beverly Hills and uh, first first date, the Getty Museum. That's if you're not going on a first date to either Saddle Ranch at 11 <laughs> o'clock or the Getty Museum, like, you know, something like those are the only two. Those are your go-tos. Huh? Like, what else would you do, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Oren. This has been awesome. We've Great. covered a lot on framing and the overlap between pitching in the boardroom and also socializing and connecting with people. People can go to pitchanything.com to learn more about yeah. the book Pitch Anything as well as your new book that's coming out. How can we find you on social media? Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, I'm Instagram, Twitter, but I would go I would go to pitchanything.com and put your name in because there is a whole cascade because we set that funnel up or whatever you call it, you know, five or six years ago where you're supposed to give people like everything, any, everything so they will like you and we haven't taken it down. So you're but, supplicating uh, yeah. at pitchanything.com. Mm -hmm. So that's how it needs to come down so you can like, get somebody to take it. But right now, if you put your name in there, like a cascade of really like world-class content will come to you. And so for right now, uh, register there. and then, uh, We're on Twitter and however that all that works. Great. Right on. 